have you ever wanted a chat GPT, but specifically for your own documents? Well, I'm here with the founder of Langchain, Harrison, and we're going to do a quick tutorial on how to build question answering over documents similar to chat GPT. My name is Rachel. I'm the founder of the AI Exchange, and we are a community of people who are actively applying AI into their work and products. And this is Harrison. Do you want to give a quick intro on yourself? Absolutely. Hello, I'm Harrison, founder of LangChain, a Python package and set of tools developed for making it easy to develop language model applications. Awesome. So in this video, we're going to walk through this CoLab notebook that Harrison has prepared. We will also add a link to this notebook in the description. And our goal with this video is to help you feel confident in understanding how you could build a Q&A over documents using LangChain, but also more generally, how do these systems work and how can you build this type of product for yourself or in your own company? Harrison, do you want to go ahead and kick us off? Excited to get started. Yeah. So we're going to start by importing the Python packages that we need. If you remember from the starter video, the first two that we're going to use are OpenAI and LangChain. And so OpenAI is the language model provider. LangChain provides a lot of the glue and the functionality for, for constructing complex chains. And then we're also going to add a third, which is face CPU. We're going to work with a state of the union text. This is just a long document. And the purpose of it being a long document is that it's actually too long to pass into GPT by itself. And I think that's an interesting challenge that you'll quickly get to if you try to do question answering over your own documents, because you generally want to do them over a large collection of documents. And in, in this case, it's a single document, but it's very easy to extend it to multiple documents. We're also going to do the setup of setting up our environment variables with the open AI key, and then we're ready to go. So the first thing that we're going to do is, is take this long text and we're going to split it up into smaller chunks. And the reason that this is important is basically we want to be able to pass in the most relevant pieces of text to the language model when we're asking questions about it. And as mentioned before, we can't just pass in the, the whole text itself because that will run into some context window errors. Here, we're going to split it up into chunks of length 1,000. You can kind of pick and choose your, your own size. There's not... A lot of science that I've read about how big those chunks should be. I think that's an underexplored area of research. So we're going to take in this text and we're going to split it up into a bunch of smaller texts. And then what we're going to do is we're going to create embeddings for these texts and put them in a vector store. So what are embeddings? What is a vector store? And why is this important? All right. So you have a piece of text. Embeddings is basically a numerical representation for that text. And the reason we want to come up with a numerical representation is it makes it really easy to do kind of like math equations with that text. So you can find other pieces of text that are similar to it. That's the main use case we'll be doing for this video. We're going to create these embeddings for each of the chunks. And then we're going to put them in a vector store. And a vector store is basically a place to store vectors of numeric numbers, in this case, the embeddings, and they're optimized for doing things like looking up similar vectors. So it's basically just a place to put these embeddings where we can look up which embeddings are close to other embeddings very easily. So we're going to run this and it will take a little bit because we're calling OpenAI's embeddings under the hood and we're storing it in face, which is an open source vector store. There are other alternatives as well that are hosted solutions that you can look into, but for a quick start, we're going to use face. Awesome. One question on the chunking, I guess, kind of while this is running. So right now you are feeding in just a straight set of text. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, what are some other types of text that you've seen fed into a system like this and how does that impact chunking? Yeah, I think chunking, again, is an underexplored area. And so I think what most people generally do is they first load the documents as text they then clean them up a little bit and remove some of the cruft. And then once they've got this unstructured text, then they start splitting it into chunks. The loading is a bit specialized to the types of documents that you're interested in doing search over. So if you're interested in doing search over Notion, for example, I have a separate repo that we can link to in the description that, that loads it from the Notion database. If you're interested in doing it over Google Drive, you, you need to write or use some logic to load from Google Drive. So the loading of the text is like one thing that's a bit specialized. Another thing that's specialized is the idea of splitting text. The main consideration here is that you want semantically meaningful pieces of text. So by default, this recursive character text splitter starts by trying to split things into paragraphs. And so it looks for double new lines, basically. You can imagine that sometimes this 
isn't good because there could be a really long paragraph. And so then what do you do? So then the recursive character text splitter basically tries to start off with paragraphs and then goes into sentences. And then if it needs to like characters themselves. And so that's kind of like a general approach to it. I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done in figuring out what the best way to split things in a semantically meaningful way actually is. So you can imagine with a code base, you probably want to split it so that the functions are together in the same chunk as much as possible. You know, you probably don't want to split in the middle of a function. That's one example, you know, for books, maybe you want to split them by chapters first and then paragraphs or something like that. I think there's probably some general stuff you can do. And I think the recursive text splitter is a good stab at that, but for a lot of specialized applications, you may want to look at the data a little bit more carefully and come up with some specific way of splitting text, because I do think it can be important to maintain the semanticness in, in chunks. Yeah, I think two other pieces of advice that I would add here is one, again, going to the semantic meaning, like really thinking about what is the unit of semantic meaning in the data you're feeding in. For example, if you're trying to use this for tweets, it's really nice because each tweet ideally has kind of a different semantic meaning. Um, and then the other piece of advice is if you try this approach with one type of chunking and it doesn't work very well, then experiment with other types of chunking. And that can be a way to have performance gains over the overall application. Really, I think while there's not a best practice of how to chunk today, it might really vary based on the application and what you're trying to do. So just experiment with more things. I think how you chunk is definitely something to think about related to how you're trying to use this. Okay, so it looks like we're using embeddings from OpenAI's embeddings. Is that the only way to generate embeddings or are there other ways to generate embeddings? There's a bunch of other ways to generate embeddings. They're similar to language models. Most providers also have embedding support. There's Cohere embeddings that you can access over an API similar to OpenAI. And Hugging Face also has a lot of embedding functionality that you can either use off the Hugging Face hub or run locally. All right, so we've got this vector store set up. Now we need to set up the logic for doing question answering over it. This is one of the more common chains. And so we're going to use a pre-built chain that's in link chain. We call it the vector DB QA chain. It's basically doing question answering over a vector DB. You can see that we pass in a language model here and we're using one from OpenAI. We then specify the chain type. There's a few different ways to do question answering over documents. Stuff is a great name and it basically refers to, you get the relevant pieces of text and you just stuff them in the same context. And then you pass that to the language model. This is the fastest because you're making one call to the language model. It's generally the best performant if you can do it because it has all the context in one place. The downside obviously is if you have a lot of documents to combine, you can't do that because it will start getting over the context length window. There are other methods in lane chain like MapReduce that can get over this in a bit more detail, but we'll stick with stuff for now. And then we pass in the vector store as well. With these three components, we can initialize this question answering chain. Awesome. If somebody wanted to learn more about other types of chain types, where could they go? We can provide a link to the documentation in the description of this video. There's a good uh, notebook that walks through the four different types of chain types that we have available. And there are pros and cons to each one. So I do think it's good to get some intuition around there. And then the other thing that I'll note that will also be in that same notebook is basically you can customize the question answering with different prompts. So if you notice here, we don't specify a prompt. And that's because we're using some pre-existing hard-coded prompts. But you could very easily imagine wanting to customize the prompts yourself and add some bit of information about how the language model should respond and what type of things it should try to answer the question about. This notebook will also go over how to customize the question answer to your specific use case by passing in different prompts and different prompt templates in particular, which we covered in last video. All right, so we've got this set up and now we can start using it with this nice little run function. We can ask, what did the president say about Katanji Brown Jackson? And... It's running a little bit and then it spits out an answer. What it's doing in this chain is it's taking this query, which is the string. It's creating an embedding for this query. And then it's looking up in this vector store, the relevant pieces of text. It's then taking those texts and it's putting them into a prompt that basically says, answer the following question, insert the query here, given these pieces of context, insert the relevant documents there, and then passes that to the language model. Then the language model responds with this, this answer here. Awesome. So I guess, why is this important as compared to just using language models straight out of the box? Like, 
what would this response have looked like if we weren't using this kind of embedding based lookup approach? Let's find out. Let's write some code live. Let's see if my keyboard shortcuts work. Okay, there we go. So let's set up the language model here and then let's just run the query on the language model. And let's see what the language model says. During her nomination announcement, President Biden said that Ketanji Brown Jackson has the potential to be one of the... So you can see here, the language model is answering this question based on all the possible information that it was trained on, right? And so there's two important things there. One, it's all pieces of information. And two, it's that it was trained on. So OpenAI's language model in this case, I think was trained up to some date in 2021. Basically anything that's happened since then, it has no knowledge about. And if we wanted to be able to answer questions about that, we need to provide the context somehow. We can do that by providing it in the prompt. The other thing is that even if the question is related to an event that happened before 2001, it could be related to information that the language model knows nothing about. You have personal notes, Rachel. The language model probably, hopefully, does not know what's in those personal notes, but you could imagine wanting to ask questions about them, even if they were from like five or 10 years ago. This is a way to basically get answers that are grounded in that information, as opposed to the full embodiment of all the information that's in the language model. So it sounds like Really, the value here is a few things. One, you can control the context that gets put into the prompt. So you have more control over the output, which can solve for things like it being factual or not. And then second, you can even give it access to new context that maybe OpenAI didn't have originally when it was being trained, such as, yeah, my personal notes. I could build this type of system querying over my personal notes um, and then be able to get specialized or customized responses basically based on those notes. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's a great way of putting it. I think this is important because if your application doesn't have kind of this type of personalization or this type of specification on, on specific proprietary or, or unknown documents, there's no differentiation between an application that you build and an application that anyone else builds. It's really kind of like bringing this extra stuff and combining it with the language model that gives it a lot of differentiation and makes it really interesting and unique for kind of some of the reasons that you just mentioned in terms of grounding it in factuality. Awesome. Another common question that I hear often is how do I prevent chat GPT or GPT from making things up if I was going to use that in my product? Could you describe, is this an approach that you could use to prevent that hallucination of information? Yeah, it absolutely is. And I think the best way to do that with language models these days is you tell it not to make things up, but you basically tell it, answer this question but only use this specific piece of information. That's when it will ground it, hopefully, in that piece of information. Another thing that you can do here, and maybe we can do another video on this later, is you can get sources for where it gets its information from. You can imagine that after we create these chunks, we can create an ID for each chunk. If these chunks of text are created from different web pages or something, part of that ID could contain the URL or the page that it's on. When we start to answer questions, we can start including that source in our answers. And again, how do we do that? We ask the language model very politely to not make things up and please cite its sources when it does so. Excellent. Great. Do you want to continue through the rest of the notebook? Yeah. The rest of the notebook is just highlighting an even easier way to kind of like load this chain. Basically, you can see here, we had to import the chain from a specific class and use a method and pass in a language model object here and pass in a chain type here. Another way to do that is to load a chain from the LangChain hub which is basically a way of sharing pre-configured chains. You notice that we still have to pass in the vector store. And again, that's because the vector store provides the interesting information. And so it wouldn't make a ton of sense to serialize it along with the chain, but we have this chain that knows how to interact with the vector store. And so we can run this and it's pulling this pre-existing chain down from the link chain hub. And now we have uh, the exact same chain as above. We can run it just as before and get a similar answer. I just want to highlight this because this is a new feature that we've added and we can include a link in the description below. But basically the idea here is just to make it really, really easy to load these types of chains. We're optimizing for making it extremely easy to build language model applications. And as you notice, this is one import and one line of code. That's what we're striving for. And we're also intending this to be a place to share chains. So I mentioned before, customizing the prompts to include different variants of tone or other things like that. We're hoping to gather kind of like a collection of these variants of prompts, which in turn are variants of chains, host them in this hub, and then people can download these different variants and play with them pretty easily. Awesome. I think this is a great overview of how to do question answering over documents. I'm curious, Harrison, to close this out, what are some other ways that people can use this general framework described here when they're building these LM applications? Yeah, I think the general framework here is basically pulling in relevant context 
and inserting it into the prompt. One method is doing it in exactly this way, where you're pulling in content that you want to get answers for, or basically auxiliary information in that capacity. Another way that you can pull in extra content based on the query is actually for some of the few shot examples that we chatted about last time. So depending on the query, you may want to give the language model different examples of how it should behave. That can be really useful because you can provide examples that are similar to the query. And so it can learn to do things in a way that it should be doing based on the query. A third way, which is even more extreme, is you can imagine basically changing the entire prompt based on the query. If the query is asking about one task compared to another, you may want to use a different prompt template entirely. This all gets back to the same idea of basically you've got the query, it's coming in. You now need to decide how to include information to pass to the language model. Those are three applications of that. Awesome. Well, I think this is a fantastic overview of a common use case, which I get asked about a lot. So I'm really excited about this notebook. Again, we will share links to a lot of the relevant documentation that we described during this tutorial, as well as a link to this collab notebook for anybody that wants to dig in and get started using LangChain in their applications or test it out. Thanks so much for watching. Harrison, any closing thoughts? Thanks for having me, Rachel. A pleasure as always. Awesome. All right. And until next time.